Hi, and welcome to this video, which will take you through some more advanced EQing techniques. I'll be processing full mixes for my examples, but the techniques I'll be using are not necessarily just for mastering, and might also be useful on channels or subgroups while mixing. Let's start with a track in a very bass-heavy style. I mixed this track away from my studio using headphones, and it suffers from the common problem of too much low sub-bass content. This mistake is also easy to make when mixing on small near-field monitors. If you can't hear the very lowest frequencies, they can easily get overhyped without you realising. I'm going to start by double-clicking the left side of the graph to create a low-cut filter. High-pass filtering a whole mix like this might seem drastic, but it was routinely done when mastering for vinyl to avoid the needle jumping out of the groove on playback, or even just to make a narrower groove in order to squeeze more songs onto an LP. Obviously that's not an issue when mastering for digital formats, but even large PA systems often don't go that much lower than 40Hz. So setting the filter frequency down somewhere around 20 to 30Hz should be a fairly safe bet, and removing the subsonic rubbish might tighten up the low end of the mix and provide a bit more headroom. Notice the slope setting below the shape field. This defaults to 24 dB per octave, but I could switch this to a steeper 48 dB setting if needed. Actually, in this case, I think we have too much of the 50 to 60 Hz region, so it might be better to do the opposite. I'll try setting this to a much gentler 12 dB per octave slope, and turn down the Q a tiny bit so my cut reaches a bit further up without totally killing the low bass. Or I might even try the 6 dB per octave setting. This type doesn't have a Q control, but the gentle slope means I can set the cutoff surprisingly high, while still retaining a significant amount of energy in the 40 to 50 Hz region. Now we've hit a breakdown section of the track, which features a bass sound with some extreme stereo effects. This is not as big a problem for digital formats as it would be for vinyl mastering, but sub-bass is not directional enough for stereo imaging to work, and many playback systems will mono the subs even if the rest of the rig is stereo, so it's common practice to force the lowest frequencies to mono. Let's switch the stereo mode to mid-side, and then click the cut symbol under the stereo placement buttons. Nothing has actually changed yet, but instead of a single stereo filter, we now have two separate filters for the mid and side channels. And I can switch between these with the band select buttons, or by clicking the M and S symbols on the graph. I'll select the side band, switch it to a steeper slope, and control click the Q knob to reset it to 1. PA systems usually cross over from subs to bass somewhere between 80 and 120 Hz, so I might also set the cutoff a little higher. Now we have a steep high-pass filter for just the side channel, which is removing all stereo information from the lowest octaves of the mid. I'm still not sure I've got the mid channel right, however, so I'm going to select the mid low-cut filter and disable it, and then drag a low shelving band over from the left instead. The default shape is quite gentle, so I will turn up the Q a little so I can be more surgical, and see if I can tame the low frequencies better this way. Let's switch the graph scale to 6 dB to make it easier to see what I'm doing. There is another option I want to try, however, so I'm going to copy my settings so I can make comparisons. Then switch the low shelving band to a bell shape and set a healthy cut right down at 10 Hz. Now I can adjust the Q to control how far up the spectrum my cut reaches. This gives us a useful approximation of the Baxendale type shape, which is often found in hi-fi tone controls and which can create very smooth and natural sounding cuts or boosts. Hitting the AB button will switch back to the low shelving setting that I copied earlier, so I can keep tweaking both settings and switching between them until I decide which approach is working better. OK, let's have a different example. Here we have a live session recording with the whole band playing in the same room. The mix sounds a little on the warm side at first listen, perhaps because of the ribbon and dynamic mics I used, so my first instinct is to drag in a high shelving filter from the right and try boosting the treble a bit. If I turn up the cue, the slope gets steeper, and then starts to develop a resonant bump above the cutoff frequency and a dip below it. I'm going to dial the cue back a bit to smooth these out again, but then drag in a bell-shaped cut and position it just below the high shelving cutoff to simulate the dip part. This is an approximation of the Gerzon shelving type, which can often be more transparent than just a simple shelf. If I drag to select both bands, I can adjust the frequency and gain of them both together, 
like a funeral. and can use my mouse wheel to adjust the cue. I'm going to set a fairly wide and gentle dip at around 7k, where the vocal is in danger of becoming sibilant, and allow the shelving band to boost the air region above 10k. We don't have to use a shelving filter, however. I'm going to disable the shelving band, drag in another bell-shaped filter, and try a Baxendale type boost instead. Pro-Q is particularly good for this type of air boost, as the filters don't cramp out of shape as they approach the Nyquist limit, and the cutoff frequencies extend right up to 30 kHz, even when running with a sample rate of 44.1 as I am at the moment. Of course, bell-shaped filters are more usually used to control mid-range frequencies. I'm going to double-click to create another band, and set the cue to about 0.6, which is roughly two octaves of bandwidth. This is a wide and gentle setting, which can be used to transparently sweeten the material, perhaps by boosting the upper mid or lower treble frequencies to add presence and sparkle, or by cutting them to reduce harshness and make the sound smoother. If I increase the cue to about 1.4, we get a bandwidth of about one octave. This kind of setting can be useful to pick out individual parts of a mix. For example, I can bring out the guitar with a boost at around 1k5, or set it back in the mix with a little cut. This is also a good setting to use when hunting for problem frequencies. For example, I think the slightly over-warm sound of this mix might be the result of too much low mid or bass. So I'm going to sweep a boost around and try to identify which frequencies might be causing the problem. Boosting around 120Hz seems to make the problem much worse, so I'm going to try cutting here instead. And it seems to me that this reduces the overall muddiness of the mix and gives the kick drum more definition. Now I might turn the cue up some more and see if I can get away with a narrower cut. Higher cue settings tend to sound unnatural when boosting, but can cut frequencies very surgically and transparently. A cue of around 4 equates to roughly one third of an octave, while a cue of 8 is roughly one whole tone. These kinds of settings can be useful when there is one specific note booming louder than the others. In this case I think a slightly wider and shallower cut works better. But be aware that cutting the low mids affects your perception of the high mids and treble so I may need to revisit the boost I made to the top end. Finally, let's take a look at the processing setting at the bottom. This defaults to zero latency mode, which gives us minimum phase type EQ filters. In other words, the EQ will change the phase of the audio signal in the same way as an analog EQ. If I switch to one of the linear phase modes, we get a special type of digital EQ that doesn't change the phase of the signal but instead adds an overall delay which will increase the latency of your system. Most modern audio workstations can automatically compensate for this delay when mixing, but there will still be a delay between adjusting a parameter and hearing the sound change, so it may be better to stick to zero latency mode when sweeping around to find problem frequencies. Four different linear phase modes are available, with increasing amounts of latency as you go down the list. Higher settings provide better resolution at low frequencies, but also are more likely to suffer from pre-ringing effects on transients. As a general rule, linear phase EQ types will work better for gentle and wide cuts or boosts, especially in the higher frequencies, and they might also be a good choice in multiple miking situations where they can avoid changing the relative phase between microphones. The minimum phase zero latency mode might work better with deep and surgical cuts or boosts, or for creative tonal shaping while tracking. Pro-Q makes life much easier by allowing you to switch between these types without having to load a whole different plug. That's all I've got time for. Thanks for watching.